Hi, everyone. I'm Vince uh, Bergella. Uh, thanks for coming once again to another live session of uh, AJOG MFM. Um, today, we have a great topic uh, to discuss, uh, optimal timing of steroids. And uh, as you can see, we have an amazing uh, panel to, uh, to discuss uh, such topic. So we'll just go around and introduce each other. Ashley, do you want to start? Thanks. Good morning. Can you hear me OK? Yeah, speak up a little bit. Great. Um, hey, everyone. My name is Ashley Batterby. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. Uh, currently, I have a K-23 to um, look at a slightly different topic related to steroids, looking at glycemic control after steroids and diabetics, but really look forward to our discussion this morning. Modi? Hi, everyone. I'm Moti Gullerson. I recently just started at uh, Thomas Jefferson University as an assistant professor in OBGYN. Um, I'm really excited for today. Thank you so much for the opportunity. And I definitely have a passion for steroids. So looking forward to this discussion. Kelly. Hi, good morning, everybody um, from Toronto. Um, I'm a professor at University of Toronto. I practice at a Mount Sinai Hospital here in Toronto. Um, I've been interested in steroids for a long time now, and I want to thank Vince and the team for inviting me today. Yeah, great to have you. Cynthia. Hi, I'm Cynthia Jamfi, and I'm at the University of California in San Diego, where I'm professor and chair of the department. Uh, I have quite a bit of interest in antenatal corticosteroids from the time I was a medical student, um, and I'm just so happy to be here and to join this esteemed panel. And Matt. Hey, I'm, I'm Matt Finner, and I'm an assistant professor at the Medical University of South Carolina in the Division of Maternal Fetal Medicine, um, and uh, equally thankful to be involved in the discussion today. Thanks, everyone. Uh, so I will show kind of what we're going to do. Uh, this is hopefully the first half an hour where we'll have lecture by Ashley Mori on the, the fact that steroids should be given, again, two to seven days, that we may be given too many steroids at the wrong time by Matt. Kelly will talk about the fact that, um, you know, sometimes steroids may not have the effect we want. Um, Modi will talk about the issue really that it's more pertinent to today, how we come up with something better than we have today, better predictive models. And I asked Cynthia to, to moderate our sessions um, today. So first uh, I'm gonna put, um, Ashley on and share your slides. And um, Ashley, thank you again for being with us. You can take it away. Uh, great, thank you, Dr. Bergella. Um, I'm honored to present work on behalf of my co-authors entitled Optimal Timing of Antenatal Corticosteroid Administration and Preterm Neonatal and Early Childhood Outcomes. Our work was published in AJOG MFM back in 2020. As many of you are well aware, preterm birth is a leading cause of morbidity and mortality among non-anomalous neonates in the United States. While we still cannot prevent preterm birth, administration of antenatal corticosteroids is one of the most effective interventions at improving neonatal outcomes as they reduce the risk of respiratory distress, intraventricular hemorrhage, necrotizing enterocolitis, and neonatal death in up to 50%. However, the optimal timing of antenatal corticosteroids to maximize neonatal benefit has been debated. Thus, our objective was to evaluate the association between timing of antenatal corticosteroids and preterm neonatal and early childhood outcomes. We conducted a secondary analysis of the Genomics and Proteomics Network for Preterm Birth Research, or GPN-PBR, and beneficial effects of antenatal magnesium sulfate or BEAM studies, both of which were conducted by the NICHD. We included individuals who delivered a singleton non-anomalous neonate between 23 and zero weeks and 33 and six sevenths weeks gestation. We excluded those who had unknown timing of steroid administration and those who received more than one course of steroids. We compared the 2,259 individuals who met criteria based on the timing of steroid administration, which we defined as less than two days before delivery, two to less than seven days, seven to less than 14 days, and 14 or more days before delivery. You can see that there were multiple differences in maternal demographic and obstetric characteristics between timing of steroid administration 
Here you can see our unadjusted study outcomes by timing of steroid administration. Our primary outcome, respiratory distress syndrome, was lowest in the two to less than seven days group as shown by the light blue bars, with the incidence higher in each of the other groups. Severe neonatal morbidity was slightly higher in the two to less than seven days and seven to less than 14 day groups as shown in the light blue and light green bars compared to the other two groups. And there was no difference in childhood morbidity, which in this study we defined as death or moderate to severe CP at H2. Next, I will present the results of our multivariable logistic regression modeling that evaluated the relationship between timing of steroids and study outcomes using two to less than seven days as the referent group. After adjusting for covariates, the odds of respiratory distress syndrome was higher among all groups, less than two days, seven to less than 14 days, and 14 or more days compared to those with steroid administration two to less than seven days before delivery. With regards to severe neonatal and childhood morbidity, steroid administration 14 or more days before delivery was associated with higher odds of these outcomes compared to two to less than seven days before delivery. There was no difference between the less than two day group or seven to less than 14 day group compared to two to less than seven days. Strengths of our study included the large sample size and inclusion of early childhood outcomes. However, given the retrospective nature of this study, there still exists the possibility of unmeasured confounding. Additionally, we were not able to evaluate those who did not receive any steroids or received multiple courses of steroids, and we did not evaluate those who delivered after 34 weeks. Based on this study, we concluded that the optimal timing of antenatal corticosteroids is two to less than seven days before delivery between 23 and 34 weeks gestation. However, accurate prediction of preterm delivery remains challenging. We emphasize the importance of conducting future studies to determine how to appropriately time antenatal corticosteroid administration to maximize outcomes and reduce unnecessary exposure. Thank you for your attention. I look forward to hearing from some of my colleagues and welcome discussion at the conclusion of this webinar. Thank you so much. Uh, again, I'm Moti. I just um, thank you again for the opportunity to present some of our work. Um, you know, as we're all aware um, of the ALPS trial, which was a humongous effort that was undertaken by Dr. Giampi Bannerman and the team at the NICHD MFMU, um, this was a, a large randomized trial that essentially showed benefit in administration of antenatal betamethasone for women at risk for late preterm delivery. Now, although uh, antenatal corticosteroid administration prior to late preterm birth decreases neonatal respiratory morbidity, uh, the time interval associated with the greatest neonatal benefit remains unknown. And that led uh, myself, along with this uh, amazing team of, of researchers, to, co to come up with a, a study which was ultimately my uh, fellowship thesis, evaluating the time interval from late preterm antenatal corticosteroid administration to delivery and the impact on neonatal outcomes. So thank you for allowing us uh, to present our work. So this was a multi-center um, retrospective cohort study um, utilizing three of the highest volume delivery uh, centers within the Northwell Health System. Um, it, it essentially included all singletons exposed to at least one dose of antenatal corticosteroids. Um, we excluded uh, uh, patients that received uh, uh, steroids prior to the late preterm period, uh, major fetal structural malformations and chromosomal disorders. Um, we then divided the singletons in our study cohort into three groups based on time interval from administration to delivery, delivered less than two days, delivered between two and seven days, and delivered greater than seven days. Now, of note, um, it's important just to mention that there were zero, there were no patients uh, that had pregestational diabetes owing to, you know, again, the, uh, you know, our institutional guidelines supporting and excluding those and not administering um, late preterm steroids in that patient population as, as demonstrated in the ALPS trial. And then we used the delivered between two to seven days group uh, as the reference group, which was essentially extrapolated uh, from what was the optimal time interval as wonderfully demonstrated by Dr. Batterby and her colleagues in the previous publication. Our primary outcome was, uh, TTT, uh, was TTN, which was transient to of newborn, and we included secondary outcomes of RDS and hypoglycemia. And these were just based on diagnostic criteria for the first two, um, based on the American Academy of Pediatrics. Um, our hypoglycemia uh, uh, 
de de definitions based on institutional protocol, which was a serum glucose value of less than 45 milligrams per deciliter, uh, which actually is a bit higher than what was used in the ALPS trial of, of 40. These were baseline characteristics compared among the three groups, and there were several uh, significant differences, as noted it, uh, um, in the red box, um, which were you know, uh, controlled for in our multivariable regression analysis. When looking at our outcomes, uh, as you can see, both all three outcomes, TTN, RDS, and hypoglycemia, were significantly increased uh, in the in newborns that were born within two days of administration of late preterm antenatal corticosteroids compared to those born at two to seven days. And if you look at hypoglycemia in particular, that risk uh, decreased over time, and the, the risk was a lot lower uh, when you're looking at uh, those that were exposed greater than seven days after steroid administration. We then compared neonatal outcomes between those that were exposed to one dose versus two doses and saw significant reductions in uh, the TT, in TTN and RDS in, uh, in those that were exposed to, to um, two doses. We then stratified our outcomes based on gestational age of delivery. And you, as you can see, the risk of TTN and RDS uh, it was significantly lower in those that were born at a later state, exposed at a later gestational age. So in terms of implications, uh, you know, I think it's important to, you know, we know that it's important to time ACE, uh, steroids appropriately in order to optimize neonatal benefit. Um, you know, this really informs neonatologists to consider heightened uh, respiratory surveillance and serum glucose uh, monitoring in the appropriate neonates exposed, especially those that are delivered so soon after administration of late preterm steroids, as that has the potential to, you know, ultimately, you know, improve neonatal outcomes. Um, a very important note from this study, just to take away, is that this does not mean, you know, delivery should be delayed at least uh, two days after uh, antenatal corticosteroid administration because, you know, we have multiple, multiple etiologies of late preterm birth and there's a complexity in weighing the maternal and fetal risks of delaying delivery versus the benefit um, that we've established. So, again, that none of that was really uh, uh, evaluated in our study. So, just to, of note. Thank you. Thanks, Ashley. Thanks, uh, Modi, for presenting the first two um, papers from AJOG MFM, the Pink Journal. And now we have another paper now presented by Matt. Uh, take it away. All right. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, I, uh, again, appreciate this opportunity to give a, a brief overview of a paper we published uh, uh, last year in AJOG MFM that was investigating optimal steroid exposure and patients with a prior preterm delivery and an asymptomatic short cervix. Uh, and so national guidelines recommend serial cervical length measurements between 16 and 24 weeks in, in patients with a prior preterm birth. Um, we're all familiar with the interventions that are available to us for prevention of recurrent preterm birth. Um, but how do we use a cervical length after 24 weeks? You know, we don't put cerclage in then. The patient already should be on progesterone. And if they're not, it's probably too late to start them. Uh, and some proposed that we could risk stratify patients with uh, cervical lengths and try to time steroids better, um, which was the focus of uh, our paper. So this was a single center retrospective cohort study between 2011 and 2016. We included patients with a prior preterm delivery, singleton gestation, and who received steroids indicated for either symptoms as listed there or someone who is asymptomatic with a short cervix. Uh, we did exclude major structural fetal anomalies. Um, our prior, our primary outcome was uh, optimal steroid exposure. We defined this as ad, an administration interval to delivery of less than seven days or within one week. Um, we calculated uh, adjusted risk ratios, adjusting for patient reported race, earliest gestational age of the prior preterm delivery, and whether or not the patient had a cerclage. Um, not every patient had a cervical length after 24 weeks, so we performed a sensitivity analysis excluding the patients who didn't, uh, and that did not meaningfully change the results. Um, overall, our population, um, we found 829 patients who had a prior history of preterm birth throughout the study period. We excluded a large portion of them because uh, most didn't receive steroids, um, and then a handful uh, received steroids for an alternative indication. So that left us with 287 patients distributed between the asymptomatic short cervix and the preterm labor symptoms groups as shown. Um, there uh, were some baseline demographic uh, differences. Uh, patients did uh, report uh, differences in race and ethnicity. Um, the earliest gestational age of the prior preterm birth was uh, lower in patients with an asymptomatic short cervix. Uh, there was a slightly higher rate of cerclage in patients with a short cervix. However, that did not reach statistical significance. 
Um, and there was a lower rate of preterm delivery in patients who received steroids with a short cervix than who had symptoms, but that was not significant at less than 34 weeks. Uh, this is just scatter plot of the, the cervical length at time of steroid administration um, and the ultimate gestational age of delivery. As you can see, there's not a really significant visual correlation, but uh, the point of this slide is to show that the median cervical length when steroids were administered was really short. It was 14 millimeters with an interquartile range of 8 to 18, um, something that we would consider a really high-risk population. Um, Overall, patients with an asymptomatic short cervix receive steroids at an earlier gestational age, a median of 25.6 versus 30. Uh, they also had a longer latency to delivery. Uh, there was a slightly higher rate of a rescue course if your initial course was because you had a short cervix, uh, but that was not statistically significant. And uh, interestingly enough, there were some patients who actually received a second dose who were asymptomatic for the same indication. So optimal exposure was low overall, but it was extremely low when a patient had an asymptomatic short cervix. Um, and potentially more importantly, if a patient experienced a recurrent preterm birth less than 34 weeks in this cohort, if their original reason for the steroids just was because they were asymptomatic with a short cervix, they actually had a 48% reduction in receiving optimal steroid exposure. Um, lastly, this is just a, a visual of median latency by indication for steroids. We all know that there are different phenotypes that lead to preterm delivery. Um, the only symptoms that were statistically significantly different than patients who are asymptomatic were cervical dilation and PPROM in terms of latency to delivery. So in conclusion, rates of optimal steroid exposure were low overall. Um, they were even lower if they were indicated for an asymptomatic short cervix, even though the median cervical length was very short at 14 millimeters. Um, and there also might be a harm to administering steroids for this indication because the patients who had steroids for a short cervix that did ultimately deliver less than 34 weeks, um, there was a lower rate that they had either an initial or a rescue course that was optimally timed. Um, and uh, that's all I have. And thanks for your attention. Uh, thank you, Matt. Um, that's uh, great. And I hope we come back to that, you know, given steroids for a short cervix, you know, that started before 24 weeks, it's, uh, you know, shouldn't be done. And, and, and thank you for, for highlighting that. Um, I'm sure we'll come back to that. Next is my good friend and colleague, Kelly, who's been interested in steroids forever. Uh, Kelly, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Hi, thank you everybody once again for coming today and listening. Um, oops, I'm having a hard time advancing my slides. I can move them for you if you want. Oh, how do I do it? It's um, at the bottom of the slide, it kind of... Uh, oh, I gotcha, yep. Yeah. I have no financial conflicts of interest. Um, I have four objectives for those listening. First is to say that the benefits of steroids decline with just increasing gestational age or just rem to remind people. Steroids targets lung, but they also target brain and other organs in the baby's body. To remind us all that predicting preterm birth is darn hard. And then finally, that birth at term following steroid exposure is associated with increased long-term risks of neurologic morbidity. As it's already been said, preterm birth is a significant problem in all of our practice. Antenatal corticosteroid therapy is actually a rare example of a treatment that yields both a cost savings and an improved health outcome. But unfortunately, I'm also here today to tell you it's a double-edged sword. This is an exa a brief example just looking at neonatal death and demonstrates that the benefits of a single course of steroids decrease with increasing gestational age. So along the y-axis, we have the number needed to treat. Along the x-axis, we have gestational age. So you can see at 24 weeks, the number needed to treat is six, but at 33 weeks, the number needed to treat to prevent one death is 800. This is to remind me to thank all of our basic science colleagues and all the animals that have participated in research related to antenatal steroids because we've been informed so much by all of that work. I'm gonna share just one study with everybody. You can see the term sheep brains on top, the preterm brains 
on the bottom. The first two on the left are the control group or no steroid exposure. The second two up and down are following a single course of steroids similar to the course that we give to our patients. And finally, repeat. So you can see that antenatal corticosteroid therapy is associated with a decrease in brain weight and that it's dose dependent. <laughs> this is a slide or a slide of immunofluorescence um, for the glucocorticoid receptor of brain tissue and lung tissue. And just, you know, again, an example that yes, indeed, antenatal steroids target lung, but it also targets brain and other tissues in the baby's body. And in fact, the glucocorticoid receptor induces or represses the trans of target genes, which compromise up to about a fifth of the baby's body. Another objective is just to remind us that it is darn hard to predict those um, who are going to give birth preterm. And unfortunately, we don't do it very well. This is a large study which showed that of people who were exposed to a single course of steroids, about half of those gave birth early, and about half of them gave birth close to term or at term. Oops, sorry. Can I go back there? Oh, I got, I can, Vince. Um, finally, for the meat of the talk is to show or share with you examples of studies which followed children who had been exposed to steroids and then um, exceeded expectations and were given and gave birth at term. The first comes from a Canadian trial on single versus repeated courses of steroids. Overall, the trial showed no benefit in the primary outcome, death or morbidity, but it did show a difference uh, between repeated doses of steroids versus a single course of steroids in regards to birth weight, birth length, head circumference. You can see the head circumference was 0.6 centimeters difference, which is a lot for a baby's head. These kids were followed till five years of age. Overall, there was no difference in the primary outcome of compared um, single course of steroids versus multiple courses of steroids in regards to death or disability at five. However, a post hoc secondary analysis where they looked at kids who exceeded expectations and were born at term those children did have increased risk of death or disability at five years of age, primarily in neurosensory disability. This is another um, retrospective population-based cohort study done in Ontario. We, they compared term infants who were and were not exposed to a course of antenatal corticosteroids and followed them. The primary outcome, again, was a composite of need for um, auditory testing, visual testing, or suspected neurocognitive disorder. And in short, being exposed to steroids was associated with a higher risk of those outcomes. Not only the composite was a uh, higher risk, but each of the individual components as well. This um, next study I'm going to share with you is from a very large retro retrospective uh, population-based cohort study done in Finland. The Finns are, are phenomenal for being able to capture this sort of data. Um, they looked at term-born children and looked at expo their prior exposure to steroids and found that it too was associated with an increased risk of childhood mental or behavioral disorders. Then the authors of the study went on to do a really nifty nested term sibling pair comparison. And why that is was so strong in this cohort study was by comparing sibling pairs exposed and unexposed. It's one way for controlling for some of the unknown confounding um, in this cohort study. And again, in this um, sibling comparison study, they found that 
children who were exposed to steroids in this sibling pair comparison additionally had an increased risk of um, mental or behavioral disorders. Then the last study I want to share with you again is the follow-up study from the Aztecs trial. The Aztecs trial was a study that was done in the UK where participants were enrolled at term, so 37 to 38 and six weeks gestational age prior to elective C-section to get steroids or nothing. The original trial showed a decreased risk of their primary outcome, which was admission to nursery with respiratory distress um, uh, in which they did find a difference. Uh, their respiratory distress was primarily uh, the difference was one versus three hours of oxygen therapy. Um, the follow-up of the study demonstrated um, their overall outcome was not different, but one of their secondary analysis found that in the steroid group, the children exposed to steroids were twice as likely to be scored in the lowest quartile in their classroom. So in conclusion, I'm just going to review my objectives once again. The benefits of steroids decline with increasing gestational age. To remind people, steroids target lung, but also brain and other organs. Remind you, predicting birth is hard. Birth at term following steroids is associated with increased risk of long-term neurologic morbidity. And that prior to prescribing steroids, we need to think about gestational age, preterm risks, and be mindful of what benefits we hope to be gained when we prescribe ACS. Thank you. Thank you, Gail, Kelly, for that uh, presentation. Um, you know, we, we'll, we'll open up the discussion in a few minutes after Modi, um, Modi speaks, but uh, certainly it brings um, in some interesting um, ideas uh, to discuss. So anyway, I'll, um, uh, the last, uh, quick talk is by Mori. Mori came up with this idea of doing the stream, so that's why he gets to talk twice. Um, you know, if you come up with a problem, you come up with the solution. And, you know, I think that we all agree on this on this slide, you know, on the point that it would be great to give steroids to the right patient and, you know, that they're really going to deliver at the right time. So, uh, Mori, take it away for this part as well. Yeah, so essentially, you know, you know, how can we predict preterm birth with seven, within seven days to try and limit the number of, of new, uh, neonates that are exposed at an early gestational age, but then deliver at term? Um, so I'm just going to briefly review some of the limited evidence that we have. Um, this was a, a secondary analysis by Roos uh, et al. Uh, on the Apostle II trial, uh, which was a trial, uh, was a randomized trial for um, nifedipine for maintenance topolysis for those with arrested preterm labor. Uh, the gestational age range included was 26 to 32 weeks. They collected data on demographics, uh, cervical length, fetal fiber nectin, cervical dilation, um, and basically created two separate prediction models in those that were, you know, with or without PPROM in the total sample size of about 628. So of note, only 24% of those patients deliver within seven days. And when looking at with, uh, we, you know, they created a formula, a predictive model for women without PPROM to include variables such as whether or not there was va vaginal bleeding, uh, whether qualitative FFN was positive, and what was the cervical length. And they came up uh, with this model with an area under the curve of about 0.7. When, when looking at patients with PPROM, um, the model of the predictive model all, you know, again, included vaginal bleeding, but this time included uh, additional variables such as nulliparity and history of preterm birth. And uh, again, this, the area in the curve was, was, was much better, um, which, which makes sense given the risk of preterm birth within seven days in those that are, are presenting with PPROM. But uh, important to note, this patient population, they already received steroids. This is only patients at risk of spontaneous preterm birth. And, you know, are, how many centers are utilizing FFN still in the prediction of preterm birth as well? Something to keep in mind. This is another study from Canada from the Canadian Perinatal Network. Again, these included 20 patients between 24 and 29 weeks um, who were either presenting with preterm labor, PPROM, and asymptomatic short cervix. And they collected similar data on demographics, but they did not include data on cervical length or FFN. The sample size was a lot larger, and they included sensitivity analyses for medical surgical conditions that are associated with preterm birth. Now the rate of, of delivery within seven days is a lot higher in this in this cohort, 49%, and only 57% of those 
received uh, steroids on admission. And they, again, did this predictive modeling to create this risk score that had an, a, a larger number of variables like maternal age, gestational age, parity, smoking, as you can see in red. Um, and then, you know, you can calculate the probability of delivery usually utilizing that risk score. And the, you know, area under the curve for this uh, method was about 0.72. Again, still, we're only focusing on patients at increased risk of spontaneous preterm birth. Some of you may be familiar with the Quip app. Now, this was an app that was developed from um, uh, in the UK, uh, essentially, you know, uh, looking at whether or not you had a history of preterm birth, the gestational age of presentation, and quantitative fetal fibronectin measurements to give an assessment of not only risk of birth within seven seven days, but also risk of spontaneous preterm birth less than thirty weeks, thirty four weeks, and thirty seven weeks. And what's interesting uh, here is that in the UK, keep in mind, anyone who presents is kind of like an all treatment. Uh, everyone gets treated with antenatal steroids and gets admission. Now, if you use this Quip app and say, let's say a sensitivity threshold of 5% risk of delivery within seven days, you'd see that actually 90% of admissions and treatment could have been avoided by you know, utilizing an app like this. Um, so again, more, more and more uh, you know, data suggests, okay, this might be a good uh, predict al prediction algorithm, but of note, remember, it does include quant quantitative fetal fibronectin. They've also developed a couple other versions of it, incorporating cervical length and those that are at increased risk of, uh, of, of preterm labor, symptomatic versus asymptomatic. Just for the sake of time, I can't go into the details of regarding that. Um, and then the most recent uh, uh, study that, that looked at prediction was the QUID study, which has a number of, of leaders in our, in our field. Um, and they created a risk prediction model um, that includes uh, quantitative FFN as well, nulliparity, uh, multiple uh, pregnancy, you know, smoking status and non-white ethnicity using a sample size of about 3,000. They had an area under the curve of 0.89 in predicting birth within seven days. Um, just of note, though, 87% of this population was white, and there was a lot of missing data, so they were required to do imputation based on that. So can we make a calculator? You know, again, looking at the, th the four studies that I've, I've already described, there's a number of variables that are overlapping that we could potentially utilize as a, as a, as a method of trying to, you know, and enhance our predictive ability of delivering within seven days. Um, so, you know, essentially what would be nice, you know, again, to have any patient present the, the, uh, at, at, that are at increased risk of preterm birth. We know that we know age, we know parity, gestational age, history of spontaneous preterm, of uh, history of preterm birth, smoking, P prom, vaginal bleeding. These are all factors that we can collect prospectively. Um, Variables that were included that hopefully we can talk about in the discussion for later on is whether or not to include race and ethnicity, a variable that was recently removed from the VBAC calculator. And what about cervical length and fetal fibronectin, which may not be performed in all centers, uh, may not be as generalizable um, to all centers in the United States. But ideally, it would be, it would be great to come up with some calculator and, and, and have that uh, uh, ability. And just to finish off, like things to think about, you know, what's an acceptable risk cutoff? Um, at what risk can we say, okay, you know what, this is your risk of delivering within seven days. I'll accept that risk compared to potential long-term risks associated with giving steroids and then delivering at a later gestational age. I don't think we know what the ideal one. The Quip app uses 5%. That might be low. That might be high. I'm not sure. Interested to hear what other people think. Um, also important to note, assessment of risk is based on variables at the time of admission, but we often re reassess risk. If a patient comes in complaining of symptoms of preterm labor, two hours later, we might reevaluate their cervix, their risk might change. All of these predictive models are only uh, identifying uh, risks on a, at the time of admission. And we can't, uh, you know, we can't forget about medically indicated preterm birth. What about patients that hy with hypertensive disorders and fetal growth restriction? Are we timing steroids optimally in those patients? I don't think there's any predictive algorithm that exists that I could find uh, in, the, in those patient populations. So clearly, prospective studies are needed. And, you know, I'm hoping to, we're working on a protocol now to hopefully launch a study and, 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 and utilize all variables, including those at risk of spontaneous and medically indicated preterm birth, to come up with a, a better way of predicting who can deliver within seven days so we can time steroids optimally. Thank you very much. That was fantastic, Modi, um, as well. Uh, lots of ideas, lots of um, data. Um, Cynthia, I don't know if you want to jump in and, you know, give us your, uh, how, how do you frame, you know, the, this issue in, in your mind? You know, you've been looking at this for, for a long time. Yeah, thank you. First of all, thanks to all the speakers. It was fantastic uh, to listen to all of your talks. It's very interesting for me. I, Like I mentioned at the beginning of this, I've been interested since the time of medical school because 
when I started out, everybody was getting weekly steroids. And so it was just a very different time, an interesting time, even through residency, that was the standard of care. And then with the consensus conference from NICHD, uh, it really kind of, you know, reframed the way folks thought about steroids, timing of steroids. And, and one of the things they did back in the 90s and then again in 2000 was really to go through all of the literature related to antenatal corticosteroids because there was a lot of hesitation back then uh, as to whether they should be used um, and kind of look through the animal data and all of the available um, follow-up from randomized trials. And I think they were pretty comfortable in the use of antenatal corticosteroids. Um, I think there's two major questions that we have here. First, how can we predict um, the timing, right, which is what the, this goal is, and, and how can we um, understand who will deliver in that, you know, wonderful two to seven day period? Because when we were doing the multiple courses, it's because we knew that after seven days, there might be some decrease to that benefit. Um, and then the other question is, what is the harm of having someone receive steroids, but then not deliver in that period? So I think those are the two that we uh, should cover. And just interestingly, looking at what Modi just presented, I think, um, you know, when we had designed the late preterm steroids trial, the ALPS trial, we actually went back to look, there's a very important question to us, right? Because we wanted to be able to give steroids to the people who would actually deliver. Um, otherwise, you just have a bunch of people delivering at term. And there are some very interesting papers that we looked at that are a little bit older than what you have cited and weren't necessarily designed with the thought of creating a calculator, but they were out there in terms of how many people who would come in with contractions or, or those types of things would deliver it within seven days. Um, and so we actually used those as the background for, for the ALP study. And that's where you see the inclusion criteria of um, you know three to four centimeters and a certain number of contractions. And in people who were you know, threatening for a preterm delivery in a three week period, over 80% of them delivered within that three week period. So it's just an interesting way to look at it. And maybe that can be added to some of these calculators. And I, I'll, I'll look back to the protocol to see what the reference was, but I remember finding it quite some time ago. So it's, it's fairly old, um, but those types of things are really, really important. And then, you know, the question of cervical length, I mean, certainly cervical length, there's still people out there who will give steroids for a short cervix. And that's probably one of the worst predictors in and of itself of, of having a preterm delivery. Um, so just um, curious as to, to what you all use in clinical practice to help time, to help say, okay, the, the delivery is gonna happen within two to seven days. Um, I'll chime in first. I definitely don't have the, the answer to this very difficult question, but um, I'll share something that one of my mentors um, told me was, an analogy to use steroids like proposing a marriage and you're not going to give them unless you're pretty certain you know the answer with the answer hopefully being delivery in two to seven days. Um, I mean, I think we use a gestalt, um, like some sort of a feeling that it's coming and time is soon, um, but definitely try and emphasize, you know, if you've got a patient coming in for rule preeclampsia, maybe rule them in or out before you just go ahead and check the box and give steroids and to try and be thoughtful um, about figuring out like, is it gonna happen in two to seven days? So I don't have the answer. I think it's more just um, individualized based on the patient, but that's something that's you know kind of a fun analogy to share with trainees. Yeah, I mean, I could, I could chime in as well. I mean, we uh, have, you know, institutional protocols related to, you know, patients who present, let's say, at risk of spontaneous preterm birth, and what's the algorithm using a cervical length, fetal fiber nectin, and then, you know, the interventions uh, based on that. But again, uh, it's what about patients that are, let's say, at increased risk of medically indicated preterm birth? There are there are centers that will, I think, administer steroids once a fetus with fetal growth restriction has abnormal Doppler. I mean, with, with clearly potentially knowing that that risk within seven days, we, it's, not, it's not clear. Um, and I think also uh, what, I, what I like to, to think about is, I mean, a lot historically, maybe people were saying, yeah, I should just give steroids because that risk is higher, but I don't really necessarily can quantify the potential adverse effects. Uh, let me just do it to be safe. I, I never knew of anything like long-term in terms of associated with it. So I think now that that's coming into the picture, I, I'd be curious to know even, are any of you even counseling on the advert, potential adverse outcomes when you're talking to patients about, about steroids? 
You know, I can say from my perspective, I, I do find it a little bit fascinating only because um, Liggins and Howie did all of the long-term studies of their trial from the 70s. And so that that has been out there. Um, they've published six-year outcomes. They published 30-year outcomes. They looked at neurodevelopment. And one of the challenges is that um, in an ideal world, right, which we don't live in, but in an ideal world, you have randomized clinical trial data, and then you have follow-up, complete follow-up of the randomized clinical trial participants because there's so much confounding and bias that goes into steroids, right? The, the Particularly early on, the ones that you think might do better will get it, or the ones that you think might do worse will get it, or there's a reason that this person got it, but the other one didn't. And so you have all of these exposures. You have your asymptomatic short cervix exposures, and you have your IUD, IUGR, abnormal Doppler, abnormal placental exposures, but they all count as an exposure. They're obviously incredibly different folks. Um, and then you're trying to look to see, well, what was the outcome? And so we're getting a lot of those papers now, whether it's from, you know, um, Finland or Taiwan, and they just have all of these like people put together as exposures, and then they go and they try to adjust for, well, this is why, you know, the folks are different. So in an ideal world, you have randomized clinical trial data, some of which Dr. Murphy showed, and then you have full ascertainment of the follow-up of those um, individuals. So you can really tell, like, you know, even though there was maybe IUGR in this group, there was IUGR in that group, and these are their outcomes. So there, ha there has been evidence of, you know, that from, from the RCT data that Lingus and Howie presented that there was not any kind of adverse neurodevelopment. I think it's kind of muddied in with the multiple core steroid studies because those clearly show that there was kind of adverse neurodevelopment. But we don't really have, aside from that, and then Aztecs, which is interesting because Aztecs showed um, in the subjective that there was an increased risk of, of being in that um, cohort of having, uh, I think it was a higher risk of, um, of uh, like not meeting their 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 uh, mark or something like that. But then when they actually did the the analyses, when they actually did the testing of neurodevelopment, there was no difference. So it's interesting how folks present like some portion of that, not others. But so it's so what you're looking for in neurodevelopment is you're looking for the results of clinical trial, like randomized clinical trial data. So you're trying to limit the amount of bias, and that's how you you. Uh, that's how I counsel the patient. So when I look at what's available, I look at all of the data we have so far, all of which in humans has always been reassuring. And you must be close, Cynthia, and then I'll pass it on to Kelly, uh, to get your long-term uh, outcomes as well. Do you wanna, you know, yeah. wet our appetite for when? Yeah, that, so we just uh, finished the recruitment of the follow-up. And like I said, in an ideal perfect world, everybody, you know, comes for the follow-up. In a, in a real world, you know, pandemic world, uh, we're going to have about half of the kids who are able to make the follow up. Um, but we don't have the results yet, but we hopefully are you know, going to analyze those and have them soon. So. Next year, maybe 2023? Yeah, no, hopefully before the end of this year. Great. Yeah. Great. We can't wait. Kelly. Yeah. I was just going to say just to further uh, um, the conversation just about the follow up. So I think when I think about the Liggins and Howie data, which is amazing and has been followed for a long time, I think back in the day, they didn't necessarily follow at the same, you know, those studies, they didn't look at the subtleties that some of the studies have today, some of the neurodevelopmental follow-up that has been done today. Um, and I think along with that, NICU care has changed too. So it's you know, it's very different, very much more robust today than it was back in 1972. And so um, also the benefits of antenatal steroids perhaps are not as great as they were in 1960 as they are, I'm sorry, in 1980 as they are here in 2022. Um, my counterpoint to, you know, cohort studies versus RCTs. And that is absolutely true that the unknown confounding in the cohort studies, you know, potentially could be tremendous. And that's why, again, like with the Rankonen study from Finland, the sibling matched pair study I, I find is, is so powerful. Um, 
But if you look at sort of the collective steroid literature, and again, it's very heterogeneous, different outcomes assessed, you know, different populations, different exposures, et cetera. From my perspective, albeit, you know, I, I also acknowledge we're probably all somewhat biased by our own research, by what we read, what we do, um, is that time and time again, all these subtle neurodevelopmental outcomes are always in the steroid arm. And so if it was, if the findings were erroneous or if they were, you know, not true, you would expect that at times you would see the findings in the placebo arm for adverse neurodevelopmental outcomes, but you never do. They're time and time again, always in the steroid arm, always in the steroid arm. So it's challenging because we know, particularly in those young gestational ages, it is clear you know, steroids save lives. They save those tiny babies' lives. They absolutely do improve respiratory outcomes. That is absolutely true. But I think what's important is that, you know, we're mindful that there is a, a second side to the story. And we really, you know, as the babies get older, gestational age progresses, maybe those benefits aren't as robust. And so we really have to think about that when we're giving steroids. You know, I'm very cautious with repeat steroids or rescue. You know, I personally do not uh, administer those. Um, and, uh, you know, I think sometimes, which is really hard for obstetricians, is for us to just sit on our hands and, and not give anything because sometimes we just want to give something and, and, and want to, you know, we want to do, do the best we can do. But sometimes the best thing we can do is, is, is not giving. So, you know, we'll so see in time. To, to expand on what Kelly, Kelly and Cynthia are, are, are saying, I think we would all agree, you know, the pool of common meaning here is that, you know, on a 24 week or if we knew she was going to deliver in, you know, four For days, sure. I think we all agree strongly, you know, she should get steroids, you know, right away. 100%. But the question is, you know, not only gestational age, but the, the prediction. And, and I, again, being an optimist and you all are working on this, for example, we have known, Matt, for decades that, you know, a short cervix at 22 weeks in an asymptomatic patient, she wouldn't deliver in a week or two, or it's well, usually never in three or four. So to me, it's madness, you know, to, to give her to give her steroids as soon as she turns 22, 23, 24 weeks. So I think that Modi showed a little bit of that light. You know, I think we can come up with an equation. Now, we use EPIC. I'm sure many of you do. And, you know, if somebody comes in right away from the information we put in, we know her risk of VTE, we know the risk of, you know, many other things. And it shows, you know, red, yellow, green, you know, we have all kinds of checks. And I think, you know, what Modi showed before, you know, age, parity, um, maybe race and proper birth, all of those things are, are in the chart, probably even before the patient comes in for whatever complains after 22 weeks. And it would be nice if some kind of percentage will be generated and right away, you know, okay, this lady presented with rupture membrane at 24 weeks, her chance to deliver it, you know, within seven days is 25%. My question here, and and, and I'll ask, uh, sorry to, to make you talk all the time, Cynthia and Kelly first and, and, and anybody else who wants, what the percentage should be for us to give steroids? You know, is 25% too high or too low? Modi showed a study that used five percent you know in a way at 24 weeks you don't want to miss anyone and we haven't talked about that either you know you really don't want the patient to deliver in four days and you missed giving steroids we, we will feel terrible and the neonatology would rightly you know get upset at us but it's really five two percent you know the the, the 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 threshold meaning you know at 24 weeks you accept that 95 percent the lady's going to be pregnant in seven or more days. Uh, I I I struggle with the number some. I don't know, Cynthia, if if you have a number in your head or or not. No, I mean, I think I think um, what Dr. Murphy said is true. Is that there's kind of an inversely proportional relationship between the gestational age and kind of the that what that risk might be. And even though the risk, if it's higher, if it's low in terms of steroids, and I don't think we have the, the final answer there, but depending on what the risk is, 
like you said, you don't want to miss a 24 or even 23 week or if you're giving steroids that early. Um, but it's it's not as critical if, if the baby's 34 weeks, whether or not they receive steroids. Now that, you know, that's in the eye of the beholder. And there's certainly patients who have had horrible outcomes with a 34 week or who has respiratory distress. But the likelihood is that's going to be much more common at 24 weeks. I mean, if there's an absolute number that we can pick, I don't think we have one because, you know, the in just watching the way over decades kind of steroid administration has changed and, and going around in circles, it would be really unfortunate if we started to not give steroids as commonly and suddenly all of a sudden we have death. Because when you're capturing the outcomes, uh, like the long-term outcomes, you're inherently capturing the outcomes of those who lived, right? So you have to also statistically account for those who just didn't make it. And then that might actually kind of change your outcomes when you're looking at long-term outcomes, because it really should be adverse neurodevelopment or death. So from that 24 to 28 week cohort, when the steroids are maturing their organ systems, um, you know, you, you really don't want to miss any of those. Um, and if you counted for death in your long-term outcome, you might actually have a, a you know, a, a null finding. Um, oh, go ahead, Dr. Murphy. Uh, I was just going to say I agree. I mean, I think the long-term outcomes, usually the composite should include, include death. I, um, I also agree is that those very, very preterm babies, we don't want to miss. So that's the challenge. Um, and as probably many people know, you know, some of the new trials that are, um, well, beta dose was just recently published and the one, you know, we're actually launching uh, uh, a large RCT in Canada and Australia looking at lower doses and seeing if perhaps lower doses of steroid exposure will give us the same bang for our buck. And maybe that's another place to go. Sorry, Ashley. Oh, no. Um, I think we both had comments at the same time. I was just going to bring up, I think um, it's a good point of um, essentially like a balancing metric. So it comes up in the most recent SMFM statement about optimal timing of steroids is we do want to count how many got steroids between two and seven days before delivery, but we also have to keep track of that number that got steroids and didn't deliver um, as a balancing metric. And then I think, you know, the changing outcomes with gestational ages, um, obviously something to consider, um, as well as um, a lot of the research I do is within the realm of diabetes. And so in addition to potential long-term neurologic um, morbidity for the neonates exposed to steroids that don't deliver. You also have to consider glycemic control in a mom with type 1 or type 2 diabetes who's getting steroids if she's really not at that high of a risk of delivery. Um, and then the only the question that I had for you, Modi or um, Dr. Bergella, anyone uh, to weigh in is when we're trying to develop these calculators or predictors of preterm birth and using like retrospective data to try and generate our equation, how do you envision accounting for bias of the providers? Just like we were talking about a little bit earlier of like confounding by indication where you may behave differently because you know something about the patient that's, that's not captured or even institutional differences in managing hypertension and you know your threshold for expected management of severe preeclampsia and how that um, would modify calculators that you're building. Yeah, I think um, I think it it would unfortunately you know it would start with having to do things prospectively, which I know can take time uh, to try and at least you know a perspective observational study observe these characteristics and what are the risks, and then you know accounting for institutional. I mean, there's certainly institutional differences, um, and uh, I, I, I'm not sure. I I, I think that it would be too hard to just create a standardized protocol without any evidence to to uh you know support what is that risk that's appropriate etc so starting off prospectively collect the characteristics see which ones uh, you know attribute a risk um i was going to say just two things one about dr murphy's mention of the beta dose trial interestingly enough less than 20 percent of those patients delivered within a week um i know that they were randomized after already getting the first dose of steroids um but that's, I thought that was interesting. And the other thing I was gonna say is in terms of, you know, Dr. Brigella mentioned, what's that risk that's acceptable for steroids? Can we use just, oh, anyone who's a singleton has a 10% or 10 to 11% risk of delivering preterm. Maybe that's the risk that I'm okay with. Um, anything above that, I would potentially give steroids. What do you think, what do you think about that? 
I mean, I think some degree the answer to this question is, is like you pick the gestational age where the calculator comes into play. Because I mean, like we were talking about before, I mean, I'm not going to accept missing a 24 week or a 25 week or a 26 weeker. But at some point, there is some number needed to treat versus number needed to harm calculation that balances out. And is that 28, 29, 30 weeks, that's when I use the calculator. Um, and or you do some sort of continuous variable where it's got to be 5% at 24 weeks, like uh, Dr. Brigello was saying, or 25% at 34 weeks, that type of thing, because it's not going to be the same in each patient that shows up. And I'm, I'm so interested in these calculators, but to Ashley's point, Dr. Battery's point, um, like the data that goes into the calculator is how good the calculator is. And like we all know, like in my study, we use categorically vaginal bleeding, right? Well, that's what was documented. Like what, what is that abruption bleeding? Is that spotting from cervical length or, or from cervical change? Um, we talk about contractions. Well, is that one or is that every two minutes? Uh, you, you don't get the detail that you need in the retrospective study to say the different phenotype of the patient other than PPROM. That's pretty straightforward. That's categorical, right? Prior history or prior just uh, gestational age when they delivered last time, that's clearly important. But it's hard to put weight into a calculator that just is fed with bad data, is I guess my thought. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a great, uh, uh, you know, a great, great point we're going over. I'm a dreamer. It would be great. You know, I'm thinking about nuchal translucency, right? You know, if you have somebody comes in at, at 3.5, you know, nuchal translucency, you'd come up with a table and it tells you alive, you know, how many congenital anomalies, how many chromosome anomalies, et cetera, et cetera. And it would be nice to have a gestational age specific, you know, 24 week, you know, here's the your chance of delivering, you know, within seven days calculated. Here is the how many times you know your baby, the great benefits of surviving and RDS and IVH, etc., and then you know the possible harm you know for twenty four weeks, and then and the same training. and then you present that to the patient, and then you tell look you know you're, you're thirty four weeks you know that there is not much of a chance of death you know but there is a chance of RDS and other things and um, you know the calculation says you have a Maybe a 50-50 at that point, you know, risk uh, will be uh, will be good. Or and everybody's different. I think that people would would do it differently. But going back to something what we said before, to live by gestalt, you know, I think that while we do have, you know, that's what I wanted to have the session today. We do have actually a lot of data. I mean, a lot of randomized data, a lot of predictive data, a lot of long-term data. We're gonna have a lot more, and and I would like that data to be put to better use and, and the patient to be to be told, you know, a little bit of, of a better, you know, um, a better scenario versus I think you should have them, I think you shouldn't, and it's just, you know, what you feel that day, uh, depending on, you know, the latest uh, paper that came out more in favor or or more making a thing of, of arms. Anyway, we're coming up on the on the top of the hour. Um, I can't thank you enough, uh, Maury, Ashley, Kelly, Cynthia and Matt for being on today. Um, I think this was very helpful uh, for for uh, I was going to say readers in this case uh, listeners. Um, I don't know if Cynthia, you want to say any parting words, and anybody wants to jump in, uh, please uh, please do. Yeah, I was going to say this was really a fantastic session, and it you know it really brings home the point of you know we're we're moving towards trying to think more objectively about everything that we do, whether it's a postpartum hemorrhage bundle or something like that. And a calculator, you know, would really be helpful. On the neonatal side, we have them for neonatal outcomes. And this is almost married to that. And it would be great to have something like that on, on this side too. So thanks for everyone and bringing up their research. And this has just really been a great discussion. Anybody else? Otherwise, uh, again, thanks for being with us. Uh, we're perfectly at the top of the hour. Thanks for listening. And, uh, you know, thanks for uh, contributing to AJOGAM FM and to research that uh, betters, you know, the, the lives and, and health of uh, women, pregnant individuals, uh, babies, um, and, uh, and really all our families. So thank you, everybody, for being with us. Have a great day.